What was the Yosemite Valley Railroad? Today on The Roundhouse, we're going to talk with somebody who's worked very hard to preserve this railroad in books, memory, and modeling. All aboard! In days past, the Roundhouse was where the railroad worker united with the steam locomotive, each to prepare for the journey ahead. Today, it's where we examine the history, the industry, the machines, the hobby, and the passion behind railroading. News, interviews, stories, and more. So climb aboard. This is The Roundhouse. Welcome to The Roundhouse. I'm your host, Nick Gozarek, and this is episode number 133 of our Trains and Railroading podcast, where we're talking about everything in the industry and the hobby. You name it, and we discuss it. Today, we are talking to Jack Burgess. He is a railroad historian who focuses on the Yosemite Valley Railroad. So we're going to learn about this very unique California short line and what has led Jack to modeling this railroad for 40 years and stayed consistent with it and... He is a wealth of knowledge on this and model railroading in general. So we have a great conversation with him in store for you. Before we get to that, though, I want to thank those of you who are supporting The Roundhouse on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash The Roundhouse for as little as a dollar a month. You're helping to support the show. And folks like Greg Robinson are making this happen. He just signed up this past month. So I appreciate the support, Greg. And if you want to help the show as well as be able to get early access to episodes or a monthly hangout with me, patreon.com slash the roundhouse. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of today's episode. First, the Strasburg Railroad. Learn more about how their mechanical services department can help with your restoration project by emailing mechanical at strasburgrailroad.com and rail and road auctions which specializes in railroad collectibles and memorabilia you can see what auctions they have coming up at bidrar.com our guest today is a modeler and overall expert on the Yosemite Valley Railroad. He's literally written the book on it. Please welcome to the Roundhouse, Mr. Jack Burgess. So glad we could have you on the show to talk about what, to me, living here on the East Coast, was more of an obscure railroad. Maybe more people know about it on the West Coast of the U.S. What was the Yosemite Valley Railroad? It was a short line that thought of itself as a mainline railroad. Um, I say that because during the summer months, they ran Pullmans. They ran uh, excursions with 15 Pullmans. You know, today, you might go on a cruise. Back in the 30s, a um, person would set up excursions that might start in Chicago, take the Santa Fe down to Grand Canyon, go on down to Los Angeles, go up to Yosemite, San Francisco, spend 30 days on the train and with three sections. In other words, three trains, one after the other. And so the YV was able to accommodate those um, trains and do it in a first-class manner. So it is not a well-known railroad, but it had its act together. Um, and it's a very interesting railroad because it goes to one of the world attractions, which, you, which is Yosemite National Park. Was it the existence of the park or the promise of it as joining the National Park Service or the freight traffic that it generated, what led to its construction? No, it was actually the passenger traffic. Um, the park was created around 1860s, and the only way to get there until the railroad was built was by a multi-day stagecoach ride. And stagecoaches didn't didn't run at night. Horses couldn't see. And so you would be spending three or four days to get to the park. Uh, there were some investors. Uh, one in particular was very, very wealthy. He was essentially a millionaire in today's, if he, in today's day. Um, and he put together some investors. They built the railroad. Uh, it took them about a year and a half. And 
then if you bought a ticket, you would take the train up to El Portel, which was right at the boundary of the National, Yosemite National Park, and your ticket got you into the park. Um, and so it just really opened up the park to thousands of people. Uh, so the passenger traffic would have probably been enough, uh, except that they had a lot of debt uh, because of the way the thing was financed. But they also knew that freight business was there because Yosemite is surrounded by thousands of acres of trees. And so within a few years, a logging operation was set up. They started hauling logs on the railroad. Um, eventually, they had a dam was built right over the railroad, and so they hauled all the materials for that dam project. Um, they had several other freight operations. But uh, it was passengers were the reason they built it. Freight was where they got their money. It was relatively late in the era of rail expansion, Something like this, you, you'd you imagine, would have been constructed in something like the 1880s. But if I'm not mistaken, it was the early 1900s that it was built, correct? Yeah, it was finished in 1907. Now, railroad construction in California was lagging way behind back east. Remember, the, the meeting of the rails was 1876. And um, so by the oh, late 1800s, we had regional railroads. You know, Southern Pacific was still gobbling up things and Santa Fe was. But California was really, it's kind of, a, you have a population center in LA and you have a population center in San Francisco. And the whole Central Valley is agricultural. So there were railroads that went through there, but they didn't uh, build a lot of other railroads. Um, there were there were some built and so forth, obviously. But um, the YV came in kind of late as far as that goes. The freight traffic, what interests me in particular when I started learning about it is the logging operation and the gravity railroad that fed that. Well, they had two inclines. Uh, the logging started in, in 1913. Uh, they logged right at the boundary of Yosemite National Park at El Portel. And I should mention, the railroad went from Merced which is in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley, just flat area, it's all agricultural, and then followed Merced River all the way to El Portel, and El Portel is about a mile from the border of Yosemite National Park. Railroads were not allowed to be built into national parks. So like Yellowstone, there was a railroad that came in from the north, stopped at the boundary, railroad that came in from the west, and stopped at the boundary. So this was... El Portel was as far as they could go, and it was the last place they could build a yard because from there into the park, it would have taken geared locomotives to get into the park. Um, So this logging operation started at El Portel. It was about 2,500 feet in elevation, higher than El Portel. So they built tracks straight up the mountain, no curves, straight up. grades up to 78% at the top, then they built a logging railroad. And that logged a lot of that area. And in fact, they had it logged out by 1923. And the winter of 23-24, they built another incline down at a station called Incline. And that was about 8,600 feet long, uh, grades about the same. And it logged way back in uh, it was finally torn out in 19, or ended in 1942, primarily because the wife of Franklin Delano Roosevelt went to Yosemite and people got here concerned about the logging that was so close to the National Park, and National Park bought it. And so that was the last timber that they had, so that operation shut down in 42. But that was a... Um, they had, during the summer, they had two passenger trains, one from Merced up to El Portel, one in late in the day went the opposite direction. And they had two scheduled freight trains, which were the log cars, not freight cars per se, but they had a dedicated log train, um, take empties up in the morning, come back in the afternoon with loaded log cars. Um, so this is loaded log cars. We're talking logs, big logs. 
uh, running on mainline trackage. That's an interesting image. A lot of times when I think about logging railroads, I'm thinking about the skeleton flat cars that are designed for really rough track. And then eventually, and those logs are probably just going direct to the sawmill there. The idea of hauling them over a main line is interesting. Yeah, well, the, the issue they had, and the investors knew that they could find somebody to take advantage of those forests if they had rail transportation out. And so it was a, a situation where the, the log mill was um, a mile past tw- mile post 24, so about 50 miles from the bottom of the incline. The, and they picked that place because it was big enough and there was a lot of sun as opposed to up in the mountains you know, where you'd have shadows and so forth in order to dry the stuff. So they, they hauled the logs long distance to get to the mill. And, um, yeah, no skeleton cars. These are regular rail cars built by Seattle, Seattle Car and Foundry just for this railroad. What's unique about them when you look at photos of them is that they, because of the steep gravity railroads, I mean, we're talking essentially close to 45 degrees. It's incredibly steep. So they had this flat panel on the end of the car so the logs would just slide off the end. I thought that was so interesting to see that. Well, and if you look carefully... The logs are chained on, all but one log is chained on, and you can't, you know what chain binders are, the truckers use, you know, they throw a chain over and then you can tighten the chains up. Um, That doesn't work on logs because as the car goes down the track, the logs will settle and you get slack. And so they would put all the logs on but one log, put these logs and just clip them on. They didn't have chain binders, they would just clip into a link and add one more log on top. So that log on top can slide forward going down the incline. So that's why they had the log bunk on one end. The other, I don't know if you would describe it as major commodity, but it seemed to suck out in the railroad's um, commodity list is mineral traffic for creating cement. Yes, Yosemite Portland Cement Company had a limestone quarry and they had an incline too. There was only 2,000 feet long because the quarry was up on a hill and that one was captive. There were two cars. One car would come up when one car would come down, same cars, as opposed to the log cars where every time a loaded log car came down, an empty went up. And in fact, on that incline, those logging inclines, as soon as the car started down, they went into regenerative braking. Um, so they were taking the motors that pulled things up, turn them into generators of electricity. And that's how they got rid of the, the, ma- the power. And so that load would pull an empty up. Um, on the limestone, it was just one car came down, one came, car came up. Um, and that was a very, well, I was going to say, it was a very productive uh, operation, except that they had also, they had, well, I should say also, they also had a um, long haul to get to the plant that created the Portland cement. Um, so they had about a 60 mile haul, and it was expensive. It added to the cost, but cement companies in those days were in collusion, and everybody knew it. They would say, there were maybe four or five of them, and they would say, okay, you get this bid, and I'll get this bid. And so they could, inf- they could cover the costs of transportation and make a profit and, quote, be competitive. Um, so that operation lasted until 44, when Henry Kaiser um, built his own operation um, just south of San Francisco, to provide cement for a dam construction project. And um, he got the project because his costs were real costs and they were so much lower because he had no rail haul. So um, he bought Yosemite Portland Cement. The paper said he bought it to eliminate the competition. No, he bought it because he knew that he could sell all the machinery for more than he bought the company for, 
which is exactly what he did. So that led those two operations led to the abandonment of the railroad. First, the lumber company went out of business. Two years later, the only remaining big hauler was Portland Cement, and that went out of business. By then, and now we're talking 44, during the war, Yosemite National Park was not necessarily closed, but um, rail transportation, there was people riding the train, was discouraged because they needed the railroads to ship soldiers from place to place. And um, so with no passenger traffic, two major industries shut down. Um, they abandoned, filed for abandonment, and they closed down in 1945. The Strasburg Railroad is an institution in the heritage railroad industry, and its mechanical services department is proud to lead the way. With the knowledge and experience that has created one of the most reliable steam railroading experiences in the country, the Strasburg Railroad is excited to offer their expertise to the rest of the industry. Strasburg's professional team provides consulting and technical assistance to take your steam locomotive or rail car project from idea to finished product. They stand behind their work and always strive to meet their customers' needs for quality, historic accuracy, and reliability at a price that is fair. Unlike many competitors, they feature a fully equipped boiler, rail car, and machine shop, so the work gets done in-house, helping you get more for your money. Send your inquiries to mechanical at strasburgrailroad.com and let the professionals get to work for you. Do you think that if the railroad could have survived through the war, seen it to the end when then passengers were encouraged to return, or better yet, if they'd held out long enough for diesels, which would have been cheaper, that it would have had a better chance at survival? I used to think that um, because it seemed logical to me because, uh, and I haven't heard it, uh, well, I was going to say, maybe in the past 10, 15 years, uh, Yosemite is flooded with people. It is a world-known attraction. If you come to California, you want to see San Francisco, Hollywood, and Yosemite National Park. Um, so people from all over the world go there. And we, we live near San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, we go down to Yosemite usually three times a year. We never go in the summertime. Because it's you can't even find a place to park, um, so I was thinking, yeah, the railroad would be great because it could haul people and there'd be less cars. And look at the railroad that goes out to Grand Canyon; it's still running, or well, it was out there, and they resurrected it, and it is still in operation. Um, but it's a totally different situation if you go to Yellowstone or to Grand Canyon, uh, whether you take the train, which we have done or you drive, which we have done, you get out there, you walk over, because it's a, the, the um, station is like 100 yards from the edge of the canyon, and you walk over and you look over and you say, wow, that is a big hole. You go by your postcards and you've seen it. I mean, there's right there, all you can do is look over or you know, you can spend the day and catch the sunsets. The sunsets are unreal. But I was thinking, you know, that's still an operation. But the difference is people go to Grand Canyon for a day, and then you leave. People go to Yosemite for two weeks. Uh, they want their car. Uh, they don't want to spend an extra four and a half hours just getting from Merced to El Portel and then taking the bus in. So that would be a five-hour ride to get to the park uh, by train and bus. Uh, so it wouldn't survive. It wouldn't solve the congestion. Um, you know, the park district has talked about closing the gates to private automobiles. It's never going to happen because people will come up with their RVs and say, I have to go in because that's where I want to camp. Or they would say, I'm coming in this way and I want to go out that way. Um, so no, the railroad would not 
not make money if it was still around today. And it would have been flooded out two more times. Since the railroad only made it to the border of the park, how did they get people from El Portel into the heart of the park? When the railroad opened, as part of your ticket price, you got a stagecoach ride uh, into the park. And then once you, if you had a two-way ticket, ticket, which you would do, then you, when you're ready, you get another stage ride back to El Portel. Um, at that time, automobiles, which were just coming online, were prohibited being in the park. That changed in 1913. The railroad then switched immediately to buses. And when I say buses, these are um, convertible cars or you know, with maybe 10 seats or 10 rows of seats. Um, so all the way up to going into the park, you would get to look out and see the canyon and, and enjoy the view. So um, the railroad took care of you, separate company, but they covered the cost of transportation in it and out of the park. You had the fortune to interview some of the guys who used to work on the railroad. What are some of the notable stories that you came across in your research and hearing them talk? Most of them are awful long. Um, I've used a lot of them in my book, and um, but one of them I didn't use. Is I was able to interview a few people. One person I interviewed was an engineer on the railroad, went to work when he was very young, and I don't remember how young, but he was the younger, youngest engineer in the state of California when he was got that position. The other guy was a brakeman, and I got to know him really well. He went to work for the railroad in 1942 when he was only 19 years old. He knew he was going to get drafted in 19 when he when he turned um, 20, which was going to be in January. He went to work in August, so he knew he had five months. And what he wanted to do was have enough experience working on a railroad that he would not go into the military as a regular soldier. He would go into the railroad corps. And so th- that summer, he wrote to what he called, and he was a great storyteller. He, he said he wrote to all the wooden axle railroads, which was the Nevada County Narrow Gauge, the YV, uh, Sierra, some others, and um, asking for a job. And he said only the YV wrote back to him and said, if you can get out here, uh, we'll find a job for you. And he did, and he was became a wiper which meant that he wiped down the locomotives. And when I said the railroad, the YV considered itself as a first-class railroad, their stuff, their, their equipment was really well-maintained. So this guy was wiping down engines every day so that there was no grease and grit and dust on them. Um, and after a couple of weeks, um, he got a promotion to become a brakeman and i have a photo of him he he has a a cap on and half sleeves which he gave to me i still have his half sleeves and if people don't know half sleeves are what engineers on steam locomotives wore because they would wear always wear a white shirt long sleeve white shirt uh bib overalls the white shirt was called a thousand miles shirt because they wore it until they put in a thousand miles and then they washed it. I'll tell you how much it smelled. And then they had these black sleeve things that went over their arm. So when they hit their arm out on a, an armrest, it wouldn't get dirty. Their sleeve itself was protected. So he's got his half sleeves on, his hat's cocked over, and he's got his elbow up on the end of the observation, YV observation car, um, which now a friend of mine owns. And um, so this guy had some great stories and uh, and I mentioned the engineer the engineer I I interviewed him in 1940 or excuse me 1980 and what I met one of what the question the questions I had for him were things I, I needed to know so I could model things so there was some um, like a little cross on the side of some of the log cars and I wanted to know what that was for so I'd ask him and so I'd say so what was this little cross on the side of the log cars for and he would say huh what was this little cross on the log cars for huh 
What was this crossing the log cars for? And then his wife would turn to him and she'd say, he wants to know what the wild is the for. Well, I thought it was so neat that they had been married so long that she could whisper to him and he would understand what she said and what I said. And then he would ask, answer my question. He didn't know the answer to that one. Well, years later, his son was at an event we had up at El Pertel, and he's talking about his father, and he said his father had been around steam locomotive so long that he was hard of hearing, but he could read lips. He couldn't read my lips because I talked too fast, but he could read his wife's lips. So <laughs> that's the rest of that story. Huh. That's fascinating to think. And part of what's nifty about the roster, it was a steam locomotive roster for the entirety of its existence, but very small engines. We're talking mainly 440s and 260s with a brief history of 1280 there for a short period of time. Why was it that the railroad chose such small locomotives? Um, it's an interesting question because all the stuff they bought was um, already old. When they were buying 440s in 1917 or 1907, no one was buying 440s anymore. Um, they were just, there was better stuff. Um, 260s were fine. If they were on top of the stuff, they would have bought 280s. Uh, they bought wood passenger cars when most people were buying steel, um, which means a lot more maintenance, but they maintained them. They were, the observation car was always looked painted and, and lettered. Um, and it ran every single day of the year. I mean, they ran on Christmas. Um, so uh, I think that that's the reason they had those kinds of things. They were the little four four O's were used off season. Uh, I mentioned Pullmans, and what they were doing for I don't know a long time. The the URI model for sure is from Memorial Day to Labor Day. They had Pullman service. Uh, you could get on a Pullman. Or, well, say you live in San Francisco. You want to visit Yosemite over the weekend. Friday evening, you take the ferry over to Oakland. Uh, the SP had a mole, which means a, a pier that ran out into the water. So you can get right off the ferry and get right on your Pullman car, go to sleep. 5.30 Saturday morning, the train would pull into Merced. You would stay in your car. The car would be taken off the SP, hooked to the YV car. They had a diner. You could wake up, have breakfast on the diner. Nine o'clock in the morning, you would be up at El Pertel. They'd bust you into the valley. You'd be there by 10 o'clock, spend the weekend. On Sunday, get on the train at 7, and you'd be back in San Francisco by 8 o'clock Monday morning and ready to go to work. Um, it was not cheap. It was not something that everybody could afford. It was $18 um, per ticket. Um, but during the off-season, they used the 4 4 with just the RPO car and the, the observation car. That gave them the mail. They could take mail. They could do um, post you know, par or parcels and so forth. And if they had riders, they had a car for them. Um, and so that that traffic was not traffic really going to the park because it was off season. It was people that lived somewhere along the line and they had to go to, to the dentist. So they would take the train in from where they lived. They would catch the train at the nearest station. They didn't have cars. Um, they'd take the train into Merced, go to the dentist, spend the night, take the train back home the next morning. So... There was a, it was a, a, an interesting thing when you start thinking about in those days when people did not have access to automobiles and uh, other kinds of transportation. Uh, there were kids I know that took the train into a grandparent's house or, or home on Sunday night and went to school all week staying at their parents' house, and then went back on Friday and went home. So their parents only saw them on weekends. Um, so it was a different lifestyle. It would be a very different way of 
thinking about the railroad as a piece of infrastructure, especially one that was built primarily for serving a park, but still was an important lifeline for the other communities that it served. This episode of The Roundhouse is brought to you by Rail and Road Auctions. You can find all types of railroad collectibles, including signs, signals, horns, locks, keys, lanterns, timetables, passes, and more. With opening bids of only $10 on many lots, you'll be sure to find something to add to your collection or train room. Rail and Road also offers fast and easy shipping right to your doorstep, and they combine multiple live and online sales methods to allow you a variety of purchasing options. Their book auction closes on June 5th, 2023, with nearly 600 books available, all with a $5 starting bid. I took a look through this myself, and there's definitely some good titles in there. You can view the full auction now at www.bidrar.com. That's bidrar.com. Rail and Road Auctions, where real railroaders and rail fans build their collections. How much of it survives today? Obviously, the railroad itself was torn out, but for people chasing the ghosts of it, what can they find as far as remaining equipment or pieces of infrastructure? Um, Equipment is very limited. So there's one engine down in Mexico. Uh, It's really in poor condition now. It's in Veracruz, which, and it's, the engine is literally two blocks from the ocean. Um, there is a caboose up at El Portel. Unfortunately, it's not doing well. Our group, we have a chat list of YV enthusiasts. We get together every year for something. Either we go up and um, hike part of the line, we've been to the top of the inclines, so forth. And one year we went up and helped uh, Yosemite National Park people repaint the caboose. And uh, so it's there. Um, there is a turntable there that is interesting because it had a concrete pit. Now I'm talking about El Portel. Um, the concrete pit remained after the turntable disappeared. I've never figured out where it disappeared, but I'm sure that locals cut it up and it's part of their houses because it's huge pieces, you know, huge timbers. And the Yosemite Conservative um, raises money from huge corporations to do improvements and things in Yosemite National Park. And one of the things they do or did was historical things. And so someone suggested to me, what if the turntable was rebuilt because the caboose is there and a shea from another railroad is there in El Portel. And so I went to the park district talked to them, said, I will draw up the plans if you guys get the money. And they got the money. So I'd already drawn the plans for that turntable and built an HO model of it. And suddenly, they're going to build a real thing. And so that was a really interesting exercise because it has to be right. You know, if it's HO and screw up something, who knows? You know, it's invisible. Um, so I spent a lot of time working on those drawings, and so that's there. It's a replica, but it's there. Uh, a YV, op- I mentioned the observation car. That's on Niles Canyon Railway. It's privately owned, but it's it's there. Um, and the Yosemite Valley Railroad RPO car is there also. It's owned by Niles Canyon. So, uh, and there was... The remains of a boxcar we found out about, oh, about 15, 20 years ago. Um, really in sad shape. The person that told a friend of mine that it existed was pretty sure it was YV. We got permission to go down there and look at it. And um, it was on a ranch, surrounded by trees. The roof had fallen in. Uh, the sides were okay. And I took a ladder and climbed up the ladder and looked inside. And on the other side, right above the door, I could see YV-609. 
that proved it was a YB. And that's the box car that I'm working on right now is the box car is, is that car. Um, I have one of the Velocipedes, and um, that's it. Very, very little was saved, partly because it was so old. You know, 1942, who wants to buy wood cars? They, they have no value. You know, steel cars were being made by then. Um, the log cars, some of those were sold. Some of the rock cars, or what people call the short hopper cars, the YV call them rock cars, uh, some of those were sold. Um, none of the passenger cars. The RPO car was actually kept by the scrapper. No, the scrapper sold the y, the, S, the, the RPO car to the Virginian Truckee, and they repainted it and ran it. And then when he scrapped that railroad, he kept it and used it as an office. And um, so it was eventually saved and eventually given to um, Nas Canyon. Because this railroad is obscure for a lot of folk and disappeared before you were born, what led you to discover it and fall in love with it? Let me expand that answer to why am I modeling it, which will answer that too. Um, I got a train set when I was about 10 years old, uh, got a piece of plywood, put it, you know, laid the track, had no switches, um, and then wanted to, and actually I found a, a plan in Model Railroad or magazine that I wanted to build, and I was, <laughs> it was way beyond my abilities in hindsight. But the problem was I didn't, my allowance didn't go very far. And I'd been building plastic models for some time by that period, by that time. Um, and so I went to the hobby shop and they had the, I don't know, my Atlas, the ones that you stick in and they work, the frog is insulated and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and they had cheaper ones that the frog was not insulated. And the guys at the hobby shop didn't know how to wire them. And so that was the end of that um, opportunity. So I went back to building plastic models. In 65, I decided I wanted to get back into model railroading. Went to the, or to the library because they had back issues of model railroader and uh, read all those articles and so forth and built a little layout which was, uh, it was kind of a switchback thing. Um, I hand laid all the track uh, and the switches but I didn't have, and it, it had a switchback, so there was actually a grade, and I didn't have a locomotive yet, and it didn't have a power pack. Um, so I wasn't sure that what I bought was to be able to get up this grade. So I bought a little 060, I think, and, um, and it worked. Um, but I finally had to tear that out, and it built a switching layout. And so in 67, by then, I'd met a guy that was taking photos of freight cars, old freight cars, 1930s and so forth, taking a few measurements on them and building models of them. And they were they were so much better than what, the stuff I was doing. I was freelancing beyond even freelancing. You know, I think I could I could have my my flat cars red. You know, anything goes, anything I wanted. And I realized, no, 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 no. That's 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 not going to work. So I decided I wanted to model a prototype. It had to be in California because I didn't think I would ever have the money to go somewhere else to see the prototype, um, a prototype. And I had friends that were doing a lot of, two, I had a lot of friends doing two foot main stuff. And I thought, I can't do that. I just about got sucked in. But I thought, I, I'll never afford to go to Maine. So I don't know what the trees look like. I don't know what color the dirt is. So it had to be in California. It could not be something like the Santa Fe, the Southern Pacific, because in those days, importers were bringing in locomotives, selling them to hobby shops, and every month there'd be, you go in the hobby shop and there's a new brass engine, and I couldn't afford that. So um, I realized I wanted to scratch build everything, because that's the only way I could afford it, and so I needed a lot of photos. And Hank Johnson had written a book on the Yosemite Valley Railroad, which had... Um, probably a couple hundred photos of the YV. It, all, it also had photos of the logging operations and so forth. But that was, then there was one book on the Sierra Railroad, which is another short line 
in California. And those photos were smaller, and there were fewer of them. So I thought, okay, Yosemite Valley Railroad is it. And the book was $13, and I couldn't afford it. But I got it for my Christmas or uh, birthday that year when I was turned 21, I guess, something like that. Um, and so that's how I got started. And um, and then I went to a Locomotive and Historical Society presentation for I have no reason no no memory why I went there but I was and I was very young and I was sitting with a guy that was a as I recall he was the principal of an elementary school and I told him what I was interested in Yosemite Valley Railroad he says well you should get hold of so and so uh, he's got a lot of pictures of the YV he says next remember this is before the internet next time I write him a letter I'll tell him that you're going to call him because he lived in Santa Cruz which is about an hour from where I live and and he did, and so I got in touch with the guy, went over, and he had about 60 photos, which he was a really good photographer. Um, and so he made copies of all of his photos for me. And then I started finding out the names of other people that were still alive that had been down there. So I was started collecting photos when a lot of these... Uh, early photographers were still around, and um, the more I collected photos, the more eager I was to find more information. Um, so it it was just a um, the hobby was model railroading, but also research. Because if I wanted to build a boxcar, I needed photos of the boxcar. And how long is that boxcar? How wide is it? So, uh, and when did they buy it and when did they get rid of it? So all of that research went into the project. And so my, um, after those first couple of layouts, we moved to the house I'm in now, still in, and I started a layout which was only a practice layout. It was based on the YV, but I wanted to fine tune my track lane efforts so I really could do it right. Uh, I'd never built scenery much, so I wanted to try different things of scenery. Um, just, is flying roadbed worth the effort or is just plywood better? You know, all those things. And I worked on that for um, probably 10 years or so until I got to the point where I had a lot of information. I knew all the track arrangements in the yards and so forth and felt that I had the experience needed to start on a final layout. And that was in 91 um, I decided to go double deck. The, there had been articles about it. I had not seen an article on somebody who had actually built one. Um, one of the editors or associate editors of Model Railroader actually started his before he, I started mine, but he didn't photo, he didn't publish it, uh, publish anything about it until um, probably two or three years after I started mine. So. What and what I decided, or what I decided, I wanted to do with my life is to model that railroad in August 1939 using state-of-the-art techniques and contest-level modeling. Meaning, every building could be put into a contest and would at least score, you know, a, a good number of points. Um, so I've never changed direction never varied off of that. You know, if I, there were models that I built early that, um, and one of them, oh, maybe two, three or four years ago now, I was looking at it and I'd, I'd gotten a lot more information. I only had a couple of photos when I built it. And I thought, man, that is terrible. And it's the wrong color. So I ripped it out and built a new building based on all the photos I had of that building. So um, on the layout, there's over 100 buildings, every single one of them scratch built. Um, I'm just about getting to the point where I've, I've got all the locomotives, all the cabooses have been scratch built. Um, working through the freight cars, working on six um, box cars right now. And when they're done, I have two more to build. And, oh no, one more to build. Uh, which is completely different. 
and then I will have all of the slack cars, box cars, stock cars, so forth done. Um, so my list of things I want to do is getting, or that I need to do. I mean, the layout is, is finished. Um, but decades ago, I read an article about a guy that had built models of every b o steam locomotive in a, that the railroad ever had. And that was a lot of locomotives. And, and a lot of them were imports or modified, you know, so forth. Um, so that drove me to say, okay, I want to build every caboose and so forth and so on. Um, so I've got... Mm, every time I think about it, I thought, man, I'm getting... I've got more styrene than I can use the rest of my lifetime. But... Um, I'm still finding things I want to do. So the layout's done, but I can, until I can't, my hand shakes too much, I can't do models. I'll still model. <laughs> That's what I find so impressive. One of the layout tour videos of Salve Your Layout, which I'll link in the show notes for you guys, is that you've been working on this, as I understand it, Jack, from 1980 until 2011 is sort of when you consider... 2011 is when you consider the layout done and you, you start moving on to rolling stock projects. How do you maintain such a focus? The fact that that you you chose this railroad and you stuck with it for that long a period and never decided, oh, I wish it had this fantasy element or I wish it had even larger steam or, or anything like that. What kept you focused? And so I thought I could do the book and... A year. It took me four years, and during those four years, I did very little modeling. Uh, I just worked on the book, research, and more and more research, and you know, how did they finance the railroad? Um, just tidbits. And so I wrote the book, and, it, and it's done very well. It sold out. Um, you can still get it online, uh, but not at the original price. But uh, what I wanted, what I wanted, what I wanted to do is make it interesting for anybody that likes railroads and also explain why things were the way they did. What is LCL? Um, how do they run extras? Um, you know, why were certain things done? Um, and so forth. And um, so, as and, and, see that, and this is partly what, partly to answer your question, is as... I was getting close to being done. I, I thought maybe I've got about six more months and I will be finished. And when I say I wrote it, I wrote it. I took all, I took all the photos and I set it up so that when I was done, I sent my publisher a CD and he sent it to Hong Kong and they published it. You know, I did the book set up, everything. Um, and so... Six months before I thought I was going to be done, I started thinking, okay, what am I going to do? What modeling project am I going to do when I get done? It has to be something challenging and something that's different. And I thought about it, and I finally thought, oh, I'll do one of the log cars. I already had all the log cars I needed on the railroad, but I'll do one in Proto 48 O scale. And I want to include every single rivet on the prototype, even the ones under the deck that you can't see. Grab irons are going to be scratch built. The only thing I think I bought was the trucks and couplers. Um, yeah. And scratch built everything else. Um, so keeping motivated as I'm winding something up, I'm already thinking about what do I want to do next? Um, you know, maybe it was about nine months ago, a year ago, as I was kind of working my way through freight cars, and there were four stations on the railroad in 1939 uh, that I didn't have room for. And so I've never built them. And I thought, well, you know, I, I finished all the structures 15 years ago. Um, I thought, oh, I could build these four st stations and have fun and get, you know, get away from freight cars for a while. So I did. I built them and put them in a display case. Um, these cars that I build right now will go into a display case. So I've, I've got projects. Well, one project I, I need to do one of these years. My friend that owns the, the YV Observation car, he's 
the outside is completely restored twice. Uh, it's stored outside, and he repainted it last year. Um, the first class section, which is about half of the car, is all mahogany, and that mahogany is all done now. And he's now has the, the second class section to work on. And in the first class section, there was a writing desk so people could write their postcards out. I'm writing the railroad, you know, whatever. And a couple of display cases above it, and uh, or shelves. And so he talked me into building that observation car in Proto 48. So this car is going to be 14, 15 inches long or something like that. Um, and except for the trucks, I already bought the trucks. Um, I think about it every once in a while. He keeps pestering me, but I said, you know, until you get that shelf done, you're not going to get this car because I'm not going to give it to you to, you know, to put in your living room. So until he gets busy, I don't have to build it. But, you know, that's this kind of project. I have a list of them that uh, I, I will do one of these days. And I kind of flip back and forth. You know, I'm, I'm pushing myself right now to finish these six boxcars I'm working on. Four of them are ready to paint. Um, and I've got another project that I've got all the 3D parts printed up for. Um, and I should get onto that one. But I should also do this, you know. So I ended up kind of flipping back and forth. And that, I like challenging projects, um, which really drives me. Um, one of the projects I finished uh, last fall was building, scratch building the crane that they had. And that was a challenging project. But I like those projects because, uh, you know, I'm sitting waiting for dinner or whatever, and I'm thinking about it. Um, how can I do this? How can I do that? How can I build the uh, this portion of the crane or you know, whatever? So it keeps me going. Since you've been connected with the same large project as a whole. It's always been about this railroad and, and modeling aspects of it, either for the layout or as separate models. What have you liked in seeing the hobby evolve and your own approach to modeling evolve with it? One of the things that... Well, I should, I should say that I have never changed my approach. And I, I mentioned uh, my little thing, you know, build it as accurately as possible and so forth. But one thing I've noticed is a move toward more prototype modeling as opposed to proto-freelancing. Um, I don't know when it was, maybe 15 years ago? I can't remember. Uh, I've known Tony Custer, who was the editor of Railroad Model Craftsman, since uh, about 1970. And you know, he was modeling railroad back east, a proto-freelance, um, Allegheny Midland. And one day I get a, a letter from him, and it was sent out to 12 people. And the letter said, I'm thinking about tearing out my layout and modeling the uh, nickel plate. And I wrote back immediately and said, you're not thinking about it. You've already decided, and you're going to have so much fun. And he is. He is loving it. Um, and so uh, I've no other modelers that I've heard him say, yeah, you know, I've, I've gone so far, it's, it's too late to go back. But I wished I would have modeled a prototype. Uh, it just, you know, you, if even if you're modeling proto-freelance, a model proto-freelance could be hard if you really want to make it appear to be the prototype. How, why did they paint this this color? You know, um, all these questions. And how can I apply that to my railroad so it looks like a real railroad? Um, so the, uh, I think that's one of the real things. And also picking a year. I pick a month. And people say, you pick a month? How can you pick a month? And I said, well, if you look in the, there's a peephole or a, a periscope that looks into the main station in Merced on my layout, 
and you can see an August 1939 calendar hanging on the wall, and it's a photo of a real August 1939 calendar that I own. Um, so that's why, and that's that's not why I picked it, um, but I picked August because I wanted the possibility of, mo- of running Pullmans. I've got Pullmans on the layout, but I've, I've never run them. Uh, and so if you're going to run Pullmans, you have to pick the summer months. Um, if you pick December, you're not going to run log trains because the wood's full of snow. So then to pick a, a year, I wanted to get out of the recession as much as possible. And by 39, we didn't get out of the recession until World War II started. But in California, things were starting to look better. Uh, the railroad, railroad was doing fine. Um, people were going to the park by train and so forth. Um, I didn't want to get into the war. And when I made that decision, I didn't realize that this whole thing about the park being shut down or it was taken over by the military for sol- or Navy, man, or Navy men that had what we now call PSD or something, post some, uh, yeah, um, that was essentially what it was. It wasn't working because here you got a bunch of soldiers with no women, no booze, and 2,000 foot cliffs all around you, and you feel like you're <laughs> caged. So uh, it wasn't a good idea, but um, but I didn't want to get into the war years. So that left me 39, 40, 41. The RPO was bought in 1938, and I there was brass models of it. It was the only brass model available at that time for the YV. Um, so that narrowed it down to that particular year. And I'm finding, like uh, Tony Custer is modeling, I think, September, because he, he picked a year uh, because he wanted certain engines to be available. Um, and I think he's pretty good. He doesn't vary. There's people that say, oh, I'm modeling 1942 to 1946 because I like this, which was sold this year, and, I, and they bought this. Okay, I mean, that's fine. You can People can do whatever they want. Um, I just like having a year, and so when we have operating sessions, I make up switch lists, and today is, uh, what, the um, 27th, and so the switch, will, switch, switch list will say August 27, 1939. Um, so it's just fun. Now that you're sharing your experience through YouTube, the layout tours, your modeling tips, what do you hope to convey to future modelers? What I'm trying to do, and I do the same thing with my articles, is I want to share things I've learned because I'm always trying to think, if I've got to do four of these cars, is there a jig I can make that'll make this step easier? Um, So I like to share techniques that I've learned, but most importantly, I like to give people um, maybe a goal or encourage them to spend more time in the hobby because you can watch TV all day long. You can be on social media. And when you get all done, you go, God, what did I do today? I don't even remember. I watched, I binge watched uh, so-and-so. Um, I don't do social media. We don't watch TV during the day. Um, but I get a lot of modeling done. And so that I get enormous amount of feedback to myself when I'm working on projects and things are coming out right. I have to tell you that I have an advantage that is extremely unique. Um, in 65, I got married and started that first land I mentioned. Um, got a divorce after 11 years, was a single parent for about 11 years. During that time, I met um, a woman who's now my wife, and one of the things that was attractive about her is she likes trains. I could not believe that I found a woman that likes trains. She actually had an in layout when she was married the first time, uh, real small. And she invited herself over uh, when she heard that I had a layout. And at that time, all the bench work was in, all the track were in. Um, I had a couple structures, 
hadn't started on scenery, I don't think. So she's been with me ever since then, and um, she has more cab rides than I do. Um, so, uh, <laughs> two stories. One is when the last of our combined three children moved out of the house, uh, we only have a three-bedroom house, and so my wife wanted a bedroom for guests. So she said, and at that time, my light, my workshop was in the garage because there was no space in the house for it. And so uh, that meant that during the winter, I'm out there with a little space heater, and during the summer, it gets warm, especially in the garage. And uh, she said, as soon as the kid moved out, she said, why don't you move your shop into the house? Oh, what an idea. So um, I eventually took over the largest extra bedroom. Uh, so I have a shop that's about 11 by 12. There's full of furniture, but there's absolutely nothing in it except my shop. Um, and, when, and she used to be a contest judge uh, when I was doing contest modeling and contest chairman for... Um, the National Model Railroad Association, our, our region, um, she became a judge, and she knew about cars and knew what it took to build them, you know, models of them, and she was a very good judge, too. So uh, one time I was working on a, a bridge. It was four feet long, all scratch-built, all styrene of a huge steel bridge, and this is when my shop was still out in the, the garage, which we now call the Iota Room. Um, and I was in watching TV with her or something, and she said, the contest is um, one month from now. Shouldn't you be out working on your bridge? Oh, yeah, all right, I'll go out there. <laughs> so um, so now I, I've been retired for 15 years, and uh, so during the day she's on her computer, she's involved in another railroad operation. We're involved in a narrow-gauge uh, real railroad, uh, she's in charge of publicity and some special events for that railroad. Uh, so she'll be working on stuff on that and other stuff. And I'll be in my shop, and which is the bedroom, of course. And so we're 15 feet apart, and we'll exchange emails about what's going on. <laughs> we'll get together for lunch. but um, So I get a lot of modeling done. It's amazing the ways in which this hobby can bring people together. It's very nice that it was able to unite you with your wife. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the Roundhouse, Jack, and sharing your experience. I'm hoping that you're already planning on setting up the Yosemite Valley Railroad Museum at some point in the future, because I want to see this collection. I want to see your layout survive forever, because seeing fo videos and photos of it online, and again, if you're listening, I've got a couple links for you in the show notes it is impressive it's amazing how you've taken this thing and really made this railroad approachable and easy for folks to kind of get the gist of just by looking at the layout and seeing there it is from start to finish and all of the documentation you've done of the real thing as well as how you've made your model of it so i appreciate you sharing that all with us i'll give you one last sentence We've talked to the California, Sec California State Railroad Museum about taking the entire layout when I'm gone. Oh, good. They are a fantastic outfit. Okay, well, thanks for having me on. Thank you so much, Jack. And now, the question of the day. Last time on The Roundhouse, we were talking to director Stephen Lowe, who created the IMAX movie Train Time. Before then, he'd created Rocky Mountain Express. Great conversation about what it takes to make a film about modern railroading, which of course led to the question, what is your favorite example of a train on film? Obviously, there were a lot of responses, and I can't get to them all here, but here are some of the ones that stood out to me. From the roundhousepodcast.com, David Croy writes, My absolute favorite train film was the 1992 Skyfire Productions VHS tape following the SP4449 Daylight from Portland, Oregon, through the Cascade Mountains south to meet up with 8444 for rail days in California. I was so excited to see this engine on the big screen with the recent documentary Train Time. Doyle McCormick is one person I would like to sit down and talk with one day if possible. 
I think that I may have seen that too, David. I think my local library had a copy of it. I'd agree with you about Doyle. Hopefully we could get him on the podcast someday. From Facebook, Jimmy Lambert writes, I'd have to go with John Frankenheimer's The Train. The story itself is excellent. The detail the film goes into showing the railway operations from the cabs of the engines to the switch towers and workshops is fantastic. It is also noted as the last major action film shot in black and white. The Train has a following extending well beyond rail fans, with many movie enthusiasts considering it a classic. Good point, Jimmy. The Train is... Really well done, and all of the practical effects, including crashing full-sized locomotives and the explosives used in a rail yard sequence, that film is one that I definitely would recommend folks check out if they haven't seen it already. Noah Davidson writes, 4501 in October Sky, bonus points for the O. Winston Link cameo. Very good point there, Noah. October Sky is a fun historical film in its own right. The train scene is a fun one, but the fact that they went out of their way, I'd thought to include Owenston Link because the filmmakers were inspired by his photography and had that in their minds when they were filming this. That was such a wonderful touch. Finally, from YouTube, Christopher Plotter writes, Responding to the question of the day, 2010 Unstoppable. Those fictional AWVR locomotives have made their way into some of the most iconic railroad paint schemes of the 21st century. I know Unstoppable has a bad rap among some rail fans, but I'm going to say I love it. I think the cinematography is amazing. I think it really makes Western Pennsylvania, Western Central Pennsylvania, and Eastern Ohio look incredible. That is an awesome film in my book. Your question of the day for this episode is, what is your favorite obscure railroad and why? Let me know on theroundhousepodcast.com where we have links to social media and you can comment on this episode or check out some of the other ones we've done. Again, this is episode 133. If you're new to the show, it's great to have you on board and you have 132 other adventures and conversations to check out. I appreciate having you along for the ride. Remember, as always, the roundhouse is our house. 